بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وأسوتنا وقائدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وبعد الحمد لله we praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى for granting us the ability the توفيق to be here today Jazakallah khair to the organizers. I am personally honored and privileged to be invited. Alhamdulillah, you were addressed by two esteemed speakers before myself, Sheikh Abdurrahman and Sheikh Navaid. Alhamdulillah, you've inshallah benefited. Time is short and I don't want to go on for too long. I'm sure you're hungry and I'm hungry as well. And this is the most difficult time to talk just before iftar because your energy levels are really low at that time <clears throat> normally you can have water you know like as soon as I came you know the brother was, you know, at the train station I said to him I said, you're not going to ask me if you want some tea or anything some refreshments but alhamdulillah we, we carry on and this this is the test and it's a very small test it's a very small test actually in comparison to some of the people in the poor countries it's a very small test the, the theme of today's discussion at this Ramadan conference, Heart of a Believer. We've had the various speakers talking about this topic of the believer's heart from different angles, different perspectives. And this issue and this topic is something that needs to be discussed more, more and more. And it's a very important issue, of course. And it's a, one of the central aspects of the teachings of Islam. The heart of a believing woman and a believing man. The heart, the qalb, the ruh, the soul. One of the objectives of our religion, one of the primary objectives of a believer is to purify his or her soul. Purify the heart, purify the soul. Um, this is actually a fard ayn, it's an obligation. It's not something that's recommended. It's not something that's just sunnah or it's just something that's good to do in Islam. It's actually an obligation. Just like we fast today, fasting is an obligation for a believer, for a Muslim. Likewise, to purify the heart, to purify the soul, to ref reform the inner self is actually an obligation. Fard ayn. It's, it's personally obligatory upon every believing man and woman. It's not something that's just recommended. And therefore, we must... As Muslims, as believers, we must take steps to ensure that we leave this world with a pure, reformed soul. Allah says in the Quran, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعْ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ On the final day in, in the next life, Allah says, لَا يَنْفَعْ Nothing will benefit. مَال وَلَا بَنُونَ Nothing will benefit us in the next life. No children, no wealth, nothing. Allah says, إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Except the one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. قَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ The word Salim, some people have a name. Salim, Salim. This means to be sound. Sound heart. The one who comes to Allah with a sound heart, that person will be, of, will be in any benefit in the next life. And one of the objectives of the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, coming to this life, Coming to this world, One of the primary objectives, you know there's a job description for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We all have job descriptions. Allah tells us, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the Quran informs us, informs us of the job description of the messenger of God peace and blessings be upon him why did he come into this world what was the reason or the motive or the intention of the, or the objective or the goal and purpose of Allah sending the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam into this world he said 
Yatlu alayhim ayatihi. He recites the verses of the Quran. So he told us about the verses of Allah, the kalam of Allah. He, he recited the verses of the Quran. This is the wahi, this is the revelation, this is kalamullah, one objective. And then he taught, yu'allimuhum al kitaba. He explained, he, he, he informed us of the verses of the Quran, and then not just that, he actually explained the verses. And he said, وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ Well, hikmata teaches them wisdom, which according to most scholars refers to sunnah. So he taught us the Quran, he, 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 he related the Quran from Allah, he relayed it, then he taught the Quran, and he taught us the sunnah, and وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ he spiritually purified the Sahaba, the companions, and he taught us, gave us guidance in how to reform our inner selves and reform our souls and our hearts. So this is an objective. It's, as I said, fard ayn, and this is actually what distinguishes a human from an animal, really. Not just even a believer. To have a reformed soul, of course, we have guidance given to us, in the Quran and Sunnah, how to reform ourselves. But this having a reformed soul, a purified soul, a pure heart, a reformed inner self, actually distinguishes a human from an animal. We all have animal instincts. Yeah? Greed. Have you seen have you seen animals? You know, just last week I, w I went to a well, a couple of weeks ago, took some children, we went to the pond. Have you ever taken some bread to the pond? Have you seen some ducks there? Yeah, you know how they fight. There's one, one duck. I was actually thinking about this. Seriously, I was thinking about this. You know, this is one big swan, massive white one, and these small, small ducks coming to. We were throwing some bread and some, you know, uh, chapatis, etc. And uh, uh, that massive swan was actually dri what didn't want nobody else to come there. Was driving the rest of the ducks away, chasing them away. Chase, chase these small, small ducks right to the, to the center of the pond and then came back and said, give me my bread. Okay, and the way they're fighting, you know, they just, this is actually an animal instinct. If humans have greed and lust and love of dunya and love of wealth, that's what the looters did. That's how, you know, this, this is, this is what, what, what human beings do when they don't have that inner reformed self, don't have taqwa in their life, God consciousness, the only way the only way where criminality can be prevented, the only way that looting can be prevented, the only way theft and robbery can be prevented, the only way violence can be pre prevented in this world is with two things. Number one, taqwa, the fear of Allah. If a person, a human, does not have a belief, only divine religion can prevent someone from doing what they do in this life in terms of harming other people's belongings and, and causing violence and corruption. Taqwa means the fear of Allah, which basically refers to God consciousness. If I do not have this sound, firm belief in my heart that everything I say, everything that I do, and everything I even write, it's not only just saying and doing, even writing. Brothers and sisters, remember that. Everything I say verbally, everything that I do, my action, and everything that I write in this life, every single thing must be, will have to be justified in the presence of God in the next life until I don't have a firm yaqeen and conviction on that, I will not, be, I will not be, uh, prevent myself and be able to save and preserve and guard myself from some of the unlawful things. That's the, if you have this God consciousness, I know every letter that comes out from my mouth, Allah will ask me in the next life. Why did that letter, that word, that kalam, that speech, that statement come out from your mouth? Think, Imam Shafi radiallahu anhu, one of the great Imams of this Ummah, when someone used to come and speak to him, he would actually think, reflect, a few seconds, he would look down, he would contemplate and then respond. Somebody said, oh Imam, what takes you so long to speak? He said, So that I rec realize, I think to myself, I reflect whether it's better to speak and respond or it's better to remain quiet because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he say? Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir fal yaqul khayran aw liyasmut The one who believes in Allah and the final day, let him say that which is good or just remain quiet, just basically shut up. This is what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying. If you have something good to say or write, and this, we have to be very careful every letter that you type on that forum, 
every word that you type on Facebook because it's very easy to commit haram and sin on the internet than say something verbally. If I start saying something verbally to someone here, you might just get a punch. But you're behind your screen, you know, on your laptop, nobody knows who you are. Every Abdullah has become Aisha and every Aisha has become, you know, Zayd and Amr has become Fatima and, and someone's 20 and they're 60 and someone's 45 and they're 18. And you know, there's a great risk and chance of you committing sins. We need to think to ourselves, every word that you've typed out on that forum, if it's hurt someone's feelings, if you've caused any corruption or violence or any sort of unrest or anything, you've hurt people's feelings, you've, been, you've slandered, swearing, backbiting, and spreading of rumors, rumors about people, false accusations, then that will have to be justified. Allah will take us to account for that. Brother and sister, we must realize this. This is what Ramadan is telling us. Ramadan fasting is not just about staying away from food and drink. The most easiest thing that a person can do is stay away from food and drink. And this is actually in the hadith, of the Muslim, in the Sahih of Imam Ibn Hibban. It's actually a sound Sahih hadith. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لَيْسَ الصِّيَامُ مِنَ الطَّعَامِ وَالشَّرَابِ إِنَّمَا الصِّيَامُ مِنَ اللَّغْوِ وَالرَّفَثِ Fasting is not really staying away from food and drink. That's easy. That's not difficult. Who can't stay away from food and drink for a, like a you know, day or half a day or a three quarters of a day? That's no real fasting. Real, real fasting that Allah wants. This is just a training so that we, we, we stay away from food and drink so that it, it makes us create a habit that we stay away from the more uh, harmful things. The things like he said, Real fasting is to stay away from futile activities, from obscene, from obscene conversation, from being foul mouthed, from slander, from swearing. Uh, another hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Rubba sa'imin laysa lahu min siyamihi illa al-ju'u wal-atash. وَكَمْ مِنْ صَائِمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُ مِنْ صِيَامِهِ إِلَّا الْجُوعُ وَالْعَطَشِ How many people fast? They, they have nothing from their fast except hunger and thirst. That's it. No big deal. وَكَمْ مِنْ قَائِمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُ مِنْ قِيَامِهِ إِلَّا السَّحْرِ How many people stay awake and offer taraweeh and qiyamu layl all night, but they have nothing except just being tired? Because of the heart not being there, not having sincerity, not having ikhlas. So that's real fast. Avoiding backbiting. The worst thing you can do or I can do, we can do is backbite. You know, backbiting is one of the greatest sins in Islam. وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا Surah Al-Hujurat is an amazing surah. What does Allah say? يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اشْتَنِبُوا كَثِيرًا مِنَ الظَّنِ Oh, you who believe, avoid suspicion. We, we always suspect people. It, this, is, this is a disease. Suspicion is a major إِنَّ بَعْضَ الظَّنِّ إِثْم Major sin. The moment you look at a sister, or you look at a brother, or you look at someone and say, hmm, okay, yeah, that's it, I know, yeah, this guy's from that group. The moment, the moment you look at someone's face, in the husna dhanni min ibadatillah, the hadith says having good opinion is a form of worshipping Allah. We are supposed to, by default, give, have good opinion about everybody and anybody. But we, we are the opposite, seriously, and it's a big problem. We will meet each other, we greet one another. Every time you see someone, okay, he's probably, mm, he's for, probably from the, that group, or that, that, that uh, he's probably, uh, you know, he follows some this position, or that opinion, or he's some, I don't want to take names, because this is a problem. It's a disease in our society, and it's splitting us apart. <coughs> splitting the Muslim Ummah apart. Husnul dhan, have good opinion about people. This is what, the, this is what Allah says, what, Imam Al-Qurtubi He says in, in, There's three things Allah has mentioned In this Surah Al-Hujurat And the order, the tartib the, the tartib that Allah has used He says it's, it's unique there's a, there's a significant message being given there it's, it's a unique order He said Allah said Don't have suspicion So don't suspect people of doing things So somebody might think to themselves You know what no, I won't suspect because Allah has said suspecting is haram. You don't suspect people. So you know what? I will go and investigate. 
Why should I suspect? Let me go and investigate, find out for myself why, why, you know, what this person is up to. So, Imam Al Qurtubi said, before you even think of that, Allah straight away said, "Wala tajassasu." Don't become a jasus. Don't be a spy. You don't work for the FBI. That's not your job. You're not a police officer. We we all become FBI, you know, agents. We just want to go and find out who's doing what. This sister, she's committing this haram and this brother's committing this haram. That's haram to go and seek out people's faults. Rather, Islam says, Man satara aiban satara Allahu ayuba. If even if you know that someone's doing something wrong, you can advise them, you should, in a nice, polite, kind, affectionate manner. But you have to conceal their faults. You don't start invest, you know, uh, be a, some news reporter and reporting that news all over the internet and everywhere. Man satara aiban satara Allah ayuba. We have to remember all of us have. I mean, we know inside privately. I know myself and every one of you here know. We all know how good we are and how bad we are. What good quality traits we have, what are the evil quality traits that we have. We all know that. Tuba li man shagalahu ayubuhu ana ayubin nas. The one who is concerned about his own faults doesn't have time to go seek out and search other people's faults. You know, there was, a, there was a lady who had a stomach problem. She had some stomach pains. They took her to the hospital. And she was old, so you know, old people, they don't have that much patience as people in their younger age do have. So she, when they were taking her to the hospital, so the family members were saying to her that, you know what, have some patience, inshallah. Try to, try to have some patience. Um, it's, it's okay, you'll get better. And she, she was, there was no patience. Suddenly they saw that some, they brought a patient out of, she wasn't having patience and they brought a patient out of the lift who was completely burnt, severe burns to the body. So her son said to her, Look, look, at the, look at this person, this, this, this man here. He's completely burnt. You just have stomach pains, inshallah. Everything will be okay. She looked at him, she said, well, he's burned, but he doesn't have stomach pains. You know what that means? She was so concerned about her stomach pain that the guy could be dying, he could have cancer. But it doesn't matter to her because she's only concerned about her own self. We should be like that with, with our spiritual diseases. Even minor diseases, we should be so concerned about them that we don't have time to go and seek out and search for and look for and investigate and find people's faults. So what does Imam Al-Qurtubi said? Allah said, don't, have, don't suspect. You might think to yourself, you know what, I won't suspect, I will investigate. Allah said straight away, وَلَا تَجَسَّسُ Do not. Tajassus is haram. Jasus is, an, is a, uh, a spy. That's what a jasus is. An investigator, a private investigator. Jasus. Anybody here? Jasus? No? Okay. Alhamdulillah. Even if you are, it doesn't matter. Spy. And then Allah says, after that, straight away, somebody might think that, okay, you know what? I don't need to invent, even investigate. The guy is doing, or the sister, or the man, or the woman, she is doing something haram and lawful, sinful, right in front of my eyes. It's, it's there. I don't even need to go and investigate. Now what? Shall I just tell people about it? Straight away Allah said, وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا If your thought comes, if that thought comes in your mind, one of you must not backbite. وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا يُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِهْتُمُ One of the worst sins, backbiting, one of the worst sins anybody can commit. Really, one of the worst sins. Especially whilst fasting, you know the famous hadith in this Musnad of Imam Ahmed, and this is actually a fact, it's not a fiction, it's not a made-up story. Sometimes things like this are made to happen for us to realize. It's in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, and it's a sound Sahih Hadith, where, you know the story probably, two women, they were fasting in the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they were very close to Qadata and Tamuta, very close to death, and then he called them and they vomited, and what came out from their mouth? Blood, pus, flesh. Utensil was bought and they actually vomited and pieces of flesh actually came out from their mouths and blood and pus. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he say? In Nahatani, these two women, these two, in, uh, these two, Samata Amma Ahalla Allahu Lahuma, 
wa aftarata ala ma haram Allahu alayhima. They stayed away from halal things because what food and drink it's halal normally like iftar time you will all be eating right now it's not allowed but it's in the main drink food halal water they stayed away from that whilst they were fasting but yet they did not refrain and stay away from that which allah has always made prohibited and unlawful for them they both sat with one another تَأْكُلَانِ لُحُمَ nas All day long consuming the flesh of people. So backbiting, if, if we avoid chicken and meat and, and we eat back, we do, sorry, we, we backbite, that's like consuming, the, it's cannibalism. You're, you're, you're avoiding, you're, you're, not, you're not eating chicken, halal chicken, meat and vegetables and fish, right, all day long. But you're eating, backbiting the flesh of other human beings. What's, what's the point in fasting? That's why Imam Abu Aliya, there's, there's a great Imam. There's Abu Aliya here as well, but this is another one in the olden times, one of the early scholars. He said, A fasting person remains in the worship of Allah, even if you sleep all day long, you don't worship Allah. You offer your prayers, of course. But you, a fasting individual is in the worship of Allah, but he says the condition is malam yaghtab, as long as he or she does not backbite. That's the condition. That's the condition. We have to ensure Ramadan, as Sheikh Nawaid was saying, it's a training course, it's a training session. It's a course that we, we, we acquire the quality of taqwa. And we acquire the quality of reformed hearts and reformed souls. And as I said, two things, like I was saying, only two things will prevent a human transgressing the limits that Allah has set. Only two things. Only two things. What did I say? One thing I already mentioned it. What was that? Taqwa. So I've talked about taqwa. There's only two things that actually will prevent a human, man or a woman, from transgressing the limits, the hudud of Allah. In other words, committing sins, consuming the wealth of others, harming others, slandering, swearing, stealing, robbery, theft, transgression on others, murder, killing, abuse, all of that. There's only two things. Number one is this taqwa, God consciousness, Allah consciousness. And I explained the definition of that. Without that divine religion, that divine yaqeen in the next life, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. And that's what the West needs to bring back. This religion within people. And that will solve a lot of problems in the world. Okay? And number two is to have a reformed soul. A reformed heart. And that will prevent a lot of these things that happen. Because greed and lust, love of dunya, love of the world, is actually one of the greatest sins to have love of dunya. And if you have love of dunya, if you have love of the world, that then results in people what? People stealing, robbery, theft, consuming. Allah says, do not let bil Okay, and, and this, is, this is what human, as I said, these are all animal instincts. And to have a reformed soul, a purified heart is what makes a human human. Before even being a Muslim, like the poet said, عَلَيْكَ بِالْرُوحِ فَاسْتَكْبِلْ فَضَائِلَهَا فَإِنَّكَ بِالْرُوحِ لَا بِالْجَسَدِ إِنسَانُ It's an amazing line of poetry, I really like this. عَلَيْكَ بِالْرُوحِ فَاسْتَكْمِلْ فَضَائِلَهَا your duty is to reform your heart, your soul. Complete all the good quality traits of your soul. In other words, we have all these blameworthy character traits of greed, of lust, of pride, of arrogance, of jealousy, of malice, of hatred, of love of dunya, love of wealth, greed. All these um, ostentation, pride, showing off, all these blameworthy character traits these are called blameworthy character traits spiritual diseases every single one of these spiritual diseases we need to 
Remove them one by one. That's what I said is fardu ainin. It's personally obligatory, not fard kifaya, not sunnah, not mustahab. It's fard ain. Every Muslim, man, woman, every one of us, we are responsible. We have this duty that we work on our hearts until we die. We try to reform our inner selves. Every one by one, working on one by one, removing them. At-takhliya. Takhliya is removing them. These spiritual diseases, these blameworthy character traits, every single one of them. And then replacing them with the opposite. I mean, there's no time for us to go into all of this, but I mean, you, you should, we should study these spiritual diseases. You should have courses on this with scholars and read books on the topic. Every single one, you know, there's, there's opposites. Like you have love of dunya, we need to do a takhliya qabla tahliya. So you need to, first there's takhliya, which means that's not a hadith, it's just a saying in Arabic, a proverb. A takhliya qabla tahliya. You remove every single one of these spiritual diseases and then you adorn the heart. Tahliya means to adorn. And then you replace it with a praiseworthy character trait. So we, what we do is we remove the disease, the blameworthy character trait of love of dunya. And we replace it with what? Love of Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam We remove the, pra uh, the blameworthy character trait of pride And what do we do? We replace it with the praiseworthy character trait of Tawadu and humbleness and humility We remove the blameworthy character trait of um, Jealousy, hasad And we replace it with what? What's the opposite of jealousy? Sorry? Goodwill, yes, alhamdulillah, you can say that. Goodwill and generosity is kind of the opposite of being what you call a, mi a miserly person, you know, bakhil. So your sakhi, sakhawa, generosity, which was a quality trait of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You could also have ithar, which is giving preference to others, wanting for others what you want for yourself. That, that's actually a very important quality trait. We cannot even be a complete believer. So that's a duty responsibility. So what did the poet say? He said, You have to ensure that you bring about all these quality traits on your, in your soul, reform yourself. Because Because you are only a human being by your soul, not by your body. Because bodies, we share them with the animals. Even animals have these bodies, right? They, they have the same kind of bodies, they have the same things. But human beings are ashraful makhluqat the most noble of creation and creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What distinguishes a human from an animal is the inner self, the reformed soul. As I said, I gave you the example of the ducks. If we have those same quality traits, we're not even humans. That's why Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, Imam al-Ghazali, he says, oh, he says, oh human, oh Muslim, at least be a human first. At least become a human being. And this is what we're finding today in this world, that because of these diseases, spiritual diseases, number one, there's no taqwa, there's no God consciousness, right? We, we have, you know, people, they, they prey on other people, they take advantage of others. Prey meaning P-R-E-E-Y. They, they take advantage of others. And this happens in every level of society. I mean, we have people creating havoc and violence and taking advantage of, of the wealth, of the belonging of others on the streets. Okay, it's because of looting and criminality on the streets because of one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons is all these spiritual diseases, blameworthy character traits. But some people do that on the streets, some people might do that in the treasuries of their own governments, right? The same thing they do, the same diseases contribute to their evil in the treasury of the governments. Because they have greed and lust and love of dunya and love of wealth, etc. Some people do it on the oil fields of other countries, same thing. Same diseases, but just a different way it's manifested. Some people go and usurp, usurp and take away the lands of others. Again, same disease, love of dunya, love, love of, you know, want, want, want to be, you know, proud and arrogant. So people, they, some, might, some people might do something on the streets, others might do it in the oil, oil fields of other uh, countries. People do it in different ways, but that's what human being 
has reached to a level of being to the animal instincts having those animal instincts and if we want to restore order peace and tranquility in this world this is what's needed we need divine religion we need people who have taqwa who have the fear of accountability in the next life and those who work on their souls who work on their hearts and those who have reformed and until society doesn't do that we will have destruction in in, the, in this world really so we have all these spiritual diseases what time did i start Okay, let me just quickly, I mean, the time is very short. As I said, you know, um, it's not a time really to talk, and I, I am getting a bit more hungry now. But, um, uh, what's that? Oh, okay, I thought that was some water there, subhanAllah. It's good, I was going to tell you, why do you keep water here? It's, it's Ramadan, but, alhamdulillah. Um, there's, there's just a few I want to just briefly just touch upon one or two. I've got about 10-15 minutes, inshallah. Just a few uh, I want to just touch upon. Just give you a, just a brief um, picture of some of these spiritual diseases, like I said. This was just like an introduction, really. Um, we have to realize, as I said, just to sum up this, that all the problems that happen, that are in the world, every abuser, attacker, murderer, killer, slanderer, swearer, does what he or she does because of a diseased heart, because of a soul that is not reformed, because of a uh, soul that is not purified, right? Now, we have many, many of these, like, as I said, praiseworthy character traits, blameworthy character traits. Let me just quickly mention some of them. We have the blameworthy character trait that we all have to work upon, every single one of us, we must until we die. Remember, until we die, this life is very short until we die. We have, a, we have this very severe disease of ostentation, riya. You know what riya is? Showing off, doing things for others. That is a severe, blameworthy character trait. It's a, it's a very severe spiritual disease. In order for us to have any sort of Reward in the next life, one of the primary messages of Islam is to do everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything. It's not just about praying. It's about everything. Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. Everything. Not just praying. Some of us think it's only about praying. It's about praying. Man salla yura'i faqad ashraq. The one who prays to show others committed it's a minor level type of shirk, right? Because you're praying for Allah, but then you also you want to show other people. It's in the hadith. But it's not just about praying. Everything we do. If we give in charity, it's for the sake of Allah. We help someone, for the sake of Allah. We're good to someone, it's for the sake of Allah. You smile at someone, it's for your Lord. You're, you're good towards somebody, it's for your Lord. And you wait for the reward in the next life. This is known as ihtisab. There's a term in, 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 in the Quran and Hadith, we have this Islamic term, ihtisab, which basically means anything you do is with the hope of reward in the next life. Especially with regards to Ramadan, there's a Hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, Muslim elsewhere, مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانَ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِ وَمَنْ قَامَ رَمَضَانَ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِ وَمَنْ قَامَ لَيْلَةَ الْقَدْرِ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِ What does the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? He says, whoever fasts, whoever prays at night, fasts in Ramadan, and the one who stays awake and prays at night on Laylatul Qadr, all his or her sins forgiven. But two conditions, Iman, so you have full belief on Allah, you have this Iman in you, and the second condition is Ihtisab, it's the golden word, Ihtisab. Only for the pleasure, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the hope of reward in the next life. Everything we do, even our relationships, when we are good to someone, we do it for the sake of Allah. We, whatever we do, we are good to our parents, our children, our siblings, our spouses, it's for the sake of Allah. I tell you one thing, if people bring this amazing quality of doing things for the sake of Allah in their lives, we'll have a better world today. The relationships will be solved if you are good to your wife, not because you want her to cook you nice biryani. Okay? If you are good to your wife, not because then you know she'll 
bring you some gifts or because she'll iron your clothes for you. Okay? You're only being good because Allah has said you have to be good. Whether she's good, whether she cooks you the biryani or not, or whether she tells, says go and get pizza from the you know, restaurant, you're doing it only for the sake of Allah, then that is what is called ihtisab, brothers. And as a wife, if you're you know, doing, things good, uh, doing good things for your husband, you're treating him well, you're looking after him, you're, you're giving him love and care and attention, not because he's going to spend on you and buy you every time he goes to the town and he'll buy you, you know, a handbag and a pair of shoes. Okay, every time you, know, you want a shoes, you see some shoes. This is actually, again, you know, this consumer society that we live in. Problems. It's one of the problems. Somebody, I was listening to one of the uh, programs the other day and somebody was speaking really well and said, yeah, one of the reasons that all these things happen is because of the consumer society that we have. People, they, are, they don't feel content until they don't have an iPhone. I do have it as well, yeah? It's not a problem. <laughs> but we live in that society. If you don't live beyond your means, if you can't afford it, alhamdulillah, I can afford this. If I couldn't, I don't want it. I, I, I don't have an iPad right now, but we live in that. We di- we, not th- it's just that something I don't like to go into. But, but we live in that society, that consumer society. Until you don't get your hands on the latest gadget, on the latest iPhone, and the iPad, and this and that, and Mac, etc. And that's what, what, what we, we've, we create the problems ourselves. So anyway, um, I, was saying, I was saying something else. Uh, what was I saying? Yeah. So if you, if you do things for your spouse only for the sake of Allah, seriously, brothers and sisters, you'll see one of the major reasons we have conflicts within human beings at, at home, family, is because people don't do things for others for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, if we want to solve friction, if we want to solve problems, we don't want friction at home, we don't want family problems, we all have to bring this amazing quality of ikhlas, Sincerity. Tasheehu niyyah, the first hadith of most books of hadith. You know that. Innam al-amalu biniyat. So it's not just about praying. But try to just build, build that. We have to work. It's not easy. But we have to. Next time you're good to someone, it's not because they will be good back to you. Don't wait for a return. This is not a transaction. Islam says Islam is not, not a religion of a transaction. You're not good to your children because they will treat you well when you're old. Don't, don't be good to your children now that, yeah, you know what, that they'll do good to us in the next life. Or don't be good to your parents because you're waiting for a return. The moment you wait for a return, don't give gifts in, your, in someone's wedding because you think they'll give you gifts when you get married. Don't go to someone's house because you think they'll come to you. Don't help someone because you think, oh, in their need of t- time of need, then they'll come for our t- time of need. Right? Because then that, that is not doing things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do it for Allah, leave it, Allah will then inshallah reward you. The reward is in the next life. Reward is in the next life. We do that, we'll see a big change in our society. And in terms of creating ikhlas and sincerity in our ibadah, worship, we should try to do as much as we can in solitude. Try to do some things you have to do in jama'ah, in congregation. You can't start praying fajr at, at home. And, but Certain acts of worship do more in privacy, in solitude, than you do in front of others. When we are in front of others, we are, oh Allah, I'm crying, 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 crying. The dua is like, how long? 20 minutes long. And if I'm in the middle of my room, then the dua is very, very short. Then that shows that there's insincerity here. So we have to try to do as much ibadah as possible uh, in seclusion. In the privacy of your home, in the privacy of your room. Right? When people are not there watching you and seeing you. So ikhlas is something which is very important. The, the blameworthy character trait is what? What is it? Ostentation, riyah. And the, the praiseworthy quality trait is to bring about ikhlas and sincerity. I will just end with one more and then inshallah we'll end. We have jealousy, as you know, and some of the shaykh may have talked about jealousy. It's, it's a very severe spiritual disease. We need to uh, replace that. We should try to have this amazing quality of ithar. Ithar is an amazing quality. It's an uh, amazing character trait, which is giving preference to others. Like I said, the hadith, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sahih Muslim, 
لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. You cannot even be a complete believer until we don't have that quality of giving preference to others in every relationship that we live in. Islam teaches us. There's a hadith in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad: لا يبلغ العبد حقيقة الإيمان. A slave cannot attain the reality of faith until he or she does not does not what. حتى لا يبلغ العبد حقيقة الإيمان حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه until we don't start liking for our brothers and sisters what we like for ourselves always put yourself in the shoes of others every time you have a relationship always put yourself in the shoes of the other and if he feels that it's hurting you then remember and realize that it's going to hurt them too so don't do that this is what Islam teaches us for one moment, every relationship, if you're a son, if you're a child, daughter, you're dealing with your parents, one moment become a parent, just go on to their side, okay. Now, now, now talk to them. If some of the scholars, you know what they said, they said, if, you, if that needs practice, then, then practice physically. Just go, okay, I'm the father, okay, beta, son, okay, just pretend. If, if, if you haven't got children, you know, if you're a husband, then one minute, just become a wife, okay, go on this side, okay. But um, thinking, imagine for one moment, if, how would I want to be treated? Every relationship, employer-employee relationship, teacher-student relationship, landlord-tenant relationship, parents-children relationship, husband-wife relationship, siblings, every relationship that we find in this world, if we go, we go onto the other side and then we think, we will see a better world. This is what we call ithar, giving preference to others. Others, the Sahaba radiAllahu anhum had this quality and attribute. وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَى أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصَةً They would give preference to others, even though they remain hungry and thirsty. They would give preference to others because they 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 knew that this life is not a, a, a life that we we it's a it's a temporary world, and they had the akhirah, the next life before them. So. Removing hasad and having ithar, and then this removing of love of dunya, and this is going to tie in with your fundraiser as well, but l removing the love of dunya from the heart. Love of dunya, brother and sister, it's a very severe disease. Uh, we have to remove this. Wanting, you know, being obsessed with mal and wealth, right? Being obsessed with mal and wealth, and wanting more and more. Don't let the worldly life deceive you. There's one, one of these Imams, he said about Imam Az-Zuhri. Imam Az-Zuhri was a great Imam of Hadith. He said that I saw nobody, ma ra'aytu ahadan, ad-dunya ahwanu alayhi min az-Zuhri. I saw nobody who, who actually thought the world to be so insignificant like Imam Az-Zuhri. Kanat ad-dunya indahu bi manzilat al-ba'ir. Dunya and wealth and worldly as things for him was like the dung of an animal. It's just something to use basically. You know, to remove the love of dunya from the heart, there's one simple solution, the only one way, one method. And that is what's mentioned in the hadith as well. Excessively remember the thing that breaks, cuts off all pleasures. If you start talking about death right now, we'll all feel sad. And of course, it's inevitable. Life is short. Thinking about life, thinking, thinking about you know, this, uh, this life being so short and so irrelevant and insignificant. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he said, I used to prevent you, because he did in the beginning, uh, of Islam from visiting graves, but then he said, Ala fazuruha. He said to the Sahaba, Go and visit the graves now. It's a sound hadith. He said, Fa innaha al akhira. What's your main objective? And this is the primary objective. Why do you go? Because it reminds you of your own death. Go and visit, go into funeral prayers, think about people's, look at dead bodies, think about this world, how short and temporary it is. It's like 50, 60 years. Imagine, just compare this life, and that's how, you know, the love of dunya will come out from the heart. It will be easy to part with some wealth. It'll, it'll, it'll be easy. It won't become that difficult. 
Think of the world. Just imagine, brothers and sisters, this life is about how many years? 60, 70 years. How many years? About 60, 70. Such a short period of time. In comparison to what our belief is, the eternal life of how many years? How many years? Yeah? Not 600 years. 600,000 million years and beyond. Just imagine. Think, think for a moment. 600,000, I'm concluding brother, yeah? 600,000, before another note comes, 600 million thousand, imagine, just imagine. I'm actually fundraising for you, okay? So, um, you give me a few more minutes. Just imagine. No, I'm saying seriously, just imagine, in the next life, you know, there's, a, there's an amazing verse in the Quran where Allah says, كَأَنَّهُمْ يَوْمَ يَرَوْنَهَا لَمْ يَلْبَثُوا إِلَّا عَشِيَّةً أَوْ ضُحَاهَا When you go in the next life, when we all go in the next life, not just you, I'm coming as well. When we go in the next life, in the Akhirah, this dunya will seem like a moment of the morning or a moment of the evening. إِلَّا عَشِيَّةً أَوْ ضُحَاهَا Okay, we read this, you know, sometimes contemplate on the verse of the Quran. We read it, we just like viz through it. Have you th think about it for a moment? Close your eyes. Think. You know what Allah is trying to tell us? A moment of a morning or a moment of the evening. You know how that is? Imagine you've lived here how many years? 65 years. And in the next life, after 600 million years, yeah, this brother came, Shafiq, yeah? I get mixed up with your name and the other brothers. Shafiq came out from his palace in Jannah, inshallah, yeah? Inshallah, we'll be together, we'll all be there in Jannah. May Allah take us all paradise, inshallah. But imagine after 600 million years, how many years? 600 million years. He's coming out from his palace. And this brother's coming out from his palace. What's your name, brother? Usman. Okay, they both came out from the palace. Say, yeah, what's, what's going on, bro? Assalamu alaikum, what's happening? Where are you, where you off to? So I'm going for some shisha. So, all right. It'll be halal. It will be halal in Jannah here, yeah, Allahu Alam. Don't ask me about this world, but in Jannah it's definitely halal. You know, people ask me, is shisha halal? I said, in Jannah it'll definitely be halal. Here, ask somebody else. Um, <laughs> see, they go for shisha and then they're relaxing. Now, just imagine, this is serious, but joking apart, seriously. Imagine after 600 million, they start talking about the dunya. Do you remember a long time ago? No. I came, do you remember you were in a place called Dunya World? About 600 million years ago. Do you remember? Oh yeah, yeah, I do remember, yeah, I, I remember vaguely, I, I remember I was born, then I think I studied medicine or something. I went to university, I got married, I had children, then I died. Yeah, about 60 years. <laughs> then I died and then I came to this, like, I've been here for 600 million years now. <laughs> That's dunya, a moment of the morning or a moment of the evening. That's what Allah is telling us. It's just like, you vaguely remember the dunya. This is what this life is about. Life is so fast. You know, if you want to see a fast forwarded life of someone, you know, this happens. I was just, the other day, I wasn't, you know, this was like three, four weeks ago. But on, you just go on YouTube. I was just looking at this scholar, this particular scholar from subcontinent, some of his speeches. You know, I was interested in some topic and he was talking about some issues. So, you know, YouTube videos, they lead one thing to another and sometimes, astaghfirullah, it leads it to some whatever. But anyway, he, he, there are so many of his videos. Now, you look at his life. I saw him, and the next video that I clicked on, he had a white beard. First he was like young, black beard, and the next one, white beard. And then another one, I saw like they had a you know, whole video of his funeral. You just, I just saw him in his 30s, in his 60s, and, in, and in, you know, in, in his you know, funeral box, basically. And I thought to myself, that this is what life is, it's just you're on YouTube. You're literally, that's how life is, three videos. Seriously, that's how life, that's how life short life is. The poet says, we think we are at a standstill in this world. We are moving fast. We're like in a ship. Or for our better understanding, it's like a plane. You know when you are in a plane, you don't realize how fast you're traveling. Unless you start having turbulence. Sheikh Nawaid might be able to tell you. If you're traveling from Canada to here, once you have start having turbulence, that's when you realize. But if you don't, then you think you're in a house. But you're really what? Moving at a very fast speed. We're moving to our death, the poet says. Zamanu bina yajri. Right? So think about this. This is the alaj and remedy of removing love of dunya. Wealth comes, wealth goes. We need to use the world. I'm not saying we all become hungry and poor and just that's it, we just start, you know, begging. No, Islam doesn't say that. Islam says take the means, use the world, earn a livelihood. 
do your careers, become a medic or a lawyer or a barrister or whatever you want to do, but your primary objective is not your career, not your wages, not your money, not wealth. Primary objective is to do something positive in the society, help other human beings. That's your primary objective. And remove, so we have the world, we use the world, but what do we do? We remove the love, obsession with wealth. And once we do that, then it'll be easy for us to give. Think about the poor people. I mean, this, this is very important. We are, you know, we at least have, have two pastries and two samosas and so many things to eat at the time of iftar. We don't eat all day, but we, have, we eat in the evening. There are people in the world, and as you know, specifically in East Africa, who have not seen food for like weeks and weeks and weeks. Just for one moment, we should think, you know, just think about it. If you have zakat to give, and maybe students don't, I mean, you were, think, we're thinking about it. I know we have, we have loans to pay off. We have student loans, and we have this, and we have that. But these people, I mean, imagine. You see, the human being is in kafura. Allah says we are very selfish. Again, spiritual disease. Everybody just thinks about their own self. We live in a box. Oh, life is so tough and difficult. But think about someone else. Who, you know, there's people who have it far worse than you. But we live in our own small nest and box and we think that's it. Everything, the whole, all the problems of the world is just for me, that's it. All, I have all the problems in the world, nobody has any problem in the world. That's how we are. Right, so think about these people, these poor people, orphans. Give your zakat if you need to. So, you know sadaqat al-fitr? You know sadaqat al-fitr or zakat al-fitr, which is the sadaqah or the charity. So give for, uh, for the day of Eid. You can actually take that out now. You know that, it doesn't, Sheikh, you can uh, agree to that, yeah? You can, yeah, you can take that out now. You don't need to wait. It's better, of course, that you, you see the objective here is that poor people also have something to rejoice with on the day of Eid. So basically, ensuring that they have that sadaqat al-fitr on Eid day with them. Now, what do we do? You know, some of the charities, what they do here is people on Eid day, like some mosques, I don't know about charities, they have boxes, zakat al-fitr. People go and give sadaqat al-fitr. It stays with the mosque for six months. In six months, they go and give it to somebody else. Okay? So, it's better to give it out now and ensure that the money reaches the poor before Eid and on Eid day, they have the Sadaqat al-Fitr with them. Right? So, some charities, I know some charities, without taking names, they actually have this facility where you give your Zakat al-Fitr a week, 10 days in advance, and they will make sure that your Zakat al-Fitr, which is like what, one pound? 150, 2 pounds, whatever, they will make sure that that goes to the poor people on Eid day because the objective is for them to have it with them on Eid day. Inshallah, Jazakallah khair. Sorry, I'm really, really sorry for going over time. But uh, I pray Allah give us grant us tawfiq, inshallah, and uh, <coughs> give us the tawfiq to act upon some of the things that were said, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Aqul qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.